So let me just do a quick read of the topic uh, description. Gone is the status quo for TV as companies at all points in the entertainment value chain are vying for a piece of the global action. Consumer habits across various demographics are evolving, driven by technology. The future of TV involves deep insight into both the qualitative and quantitative aspects of content production and distribution and the impact that the technologies of today and more importantly, those of tomorrow will have on the many competitive and high stakes business models in place today and anticipated for the future as companies shape their strategies in response to the changes. The future will be shaped in part by the myriad of devices and content vying for our attention, as well as the rollout of faster broadband technologies, both wired and increasingly wireless, as we enter the next wave of the future. So our distinguished panel of uh, executives and analysts uh, are going to be here. We're going to debate and challenge some of the various points that uh, we'll bring up. Uh, we'll leave room at the end for some questions from you, answers from us, known as Q&A. And so let's start with letting each of the panelists take a moment to say who they are, who they work for, and how that uh, pertains to the topic. We'll start with my far left with Gene Munster from Piper Jeffrey. Hey, good morning. I'm Gene Munster. I'm with Piper Jeffrey, which is an investment bank, and I write research on public companies that uh, impact what's going on on TV. Those companies include Amazon, Apple, and Google. And we also meet with a lot of private companies that are trying to redefine how TV is, is going to be in the future. Thank you. And to his right, Darren Cross. Hi, uh, Darren Cross, uh, formerly, until recently, formerly uh, head of corporate strategy and business development for Maker Studios. Up until recently, we called them uh, Multi-channel networks. Nobody uses that phrase anymore. Uh, so, but really, um, networks uh, across platforms for creative social um, creators, uh, such as Snapchat, uh, Instagram, YouTube, etc. My focus was on uh, strategic partnerships with uh, uh, mainstream media for distribution, as well as finding new partnerships across the existing mediums. Thank you, and to his right, uh, Michael Pachter, Wedbush Securities. Hi, uh, Michael Pachter, Wedbush is also an investment bank. I'm, I'm uh, sort of a Gene Munster light, um, not, not quite as good looking and certainly not as well known, uh, but I am taller and older than him, so I've got that going for me. Have you established that in terms of age? You I don't am, have to say what that is. Are you is. kidding me? Come oh, on, be serious. Okay, here it's we go. closer than you think. You know, I, I, I think I, that I have a six handle in front of my age, so so all right. I, I'm really confident. All right, then then that must be true. Uh, then I'm not going to comment, and I'm not sure Larry will either. Larry Namer to his right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Larry Namer, uh, president of Maton Global Entertainment Group, which is a company that does a lot of uh, content development across all platforms, and particularly in Asia these days, but. Probably better known here in the U.S. as the founder of E! Entertainment Television. Thank you. And to his right, and last but not least, actually it won't, may not be last, John Corser from NBC's uh, Stuck in Traffic. Uh, that's his honorary chair right there. Ted Malone from Ericsson. Hi, Ted Malone with Ericsson. I uh, work on TV and media strategy for Ericsson. We're one of the leading suppliers of TV and media software for kind of the entire TV production value chain from compression through IPTV distribution. Uh, we're, it's primary enterprise software, so uh, we power products like AT&T, Uverse, and other TV products that you might have heard of, uh, but it's mostly enterprise software. We are involved in a lot of TV and media innovation, so glad to be here, Marty. Good. You. Glad you could be here. And uh, my name is Marty Schindler. We have a husband and wife consulting team, the Schindler Perspective. Uh, between us, we have a big four professional service firm, top five business school background, uh, supported with hands-on roles at companies such as 20th Century Fox, MGM, Lucasfilms, Industrial Light and Magic, Kodak, Cinesite, and Bank of America. Uh, through the years, we have consulted on a variety of business-related matters for companies along the entire value chain, 
Um, and uh, we're based here in Southern California, but work uh, just about anywhere. Anyway, let's, let's get started. We'll give John Corser an opportunity to um, jump in when he arrives. Let's talk about IP delivery. On a scale of one to 10, how probable is it that IP delivery will dominate the format? Is there a timeline for that? Is it five years, 10 years, or even further out there? This is a subject of a lot of debate amongst people. Who would uh, like to start with that? You're focused on the United States? Well, you know, it's the United States. It's Larry's doing a lot of work in China. Uh, I know uh, Gene covers companies in China as well. Korea and Japan and Singapore are high-tech companies. What do you think? Like high-tech high countries, I should say. I'll, I'll just uh, start it out that I, I think that it's a function of time. I think we're probably a decade away. Uh, just the broader concept of cable cutting. When we meet with uh, equity investors, public investors, the concept of TV being something that's broadcast and linear has kind of gone by the wayside, even though uh, ad budgets are still heavily weighted to that. So I think that um, the people that I work with tend to, tend to believe that this is a function of time. And then you have everything from what Amazon is doing in terms of almost doubling their investment in content, YouTube starting to ramp their video offering, other uh, offerings outside of the US. It just, it feels like uh, it's moving at the pace of a glacier, but is uh, definitely happening. G uh, Larry? Sure, and uh, particularly China, um, IP-based stuff is actually much more important now than it is here. Uh, uh, for a different set of reasons, not really to do with technology, but the fact that um, consumerism in China is is much younger. People who have money in China to buy stuff are much younger than they are in the United States. People with money in China, 25 to 40, they consume traditional forms of media, half-hour sitcoms and one-hour dramas, etc. but they consume them on a laptop uh, or now a mobile phone. So the brands that are now in the market, particularly the Western brands, have finally caught on that the people that you reach on, on broadcast television there are not the people that can buy their products. So they're moving more and more money into original online or IP-based content and stuff. And for content creators, you know, we, we go where the brands want us to go. So we're, we're creating a lot for that. Hey, Michael. Um, I, this is more of an observation than a prediction because I don't really understand why it is the way it is. Um, we have linear broadcast over IP uh, stuff like Twitch. So that's not archived. You're watching live streams on Twitch. And there's really no reason why linear television can't be delivered over IP. Um, the reason I think that it isn't is that we're just stuck with an anachronistic model, which is the cable box. And even Comcast, who I consider pretty sophisticated, they're still coming out with X1. They, they can't just cut the cord themselves and start delivering their content over an internet connection. Um, you are seeing in the US the big guys who deliver television all also deliver internet. So AT&T Uverse is both, um, Verizon Fios is both, Comcast, Time Warner, both. So why is it that they don't use the internet connection to deliver linear television? I don't get it. It's a bunch of old white guys making dumb decisions. It's going to change. I think Gene's right. I think it's 10 years out, and, and it should be 10 days out. Um, so I don't really get it. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you've got these little insidious uh, upstarts like Netflix coming in and capturing eyeballs because they give you stuff you want on demand. I mean, if you want to watch I Love Lucy, I think I just saw it was the 60th anniversary of I Love Lucy. The other you day. are a fan. Um, you mention that regularly, yeah, I, love I it. think. But if you want to watch it, you know, where do you find it? You sure, sure as hell don't find it on your cable system on demand. It's just not there, and it should be. Um, and if you're CBS and you own that, and you own the Twilight Zone, and you own the Dick Van Dyke show, why as a CBS subscriber can't I see that stuff? And would I pay more? Of course I would pay more. So I, I don't think it's going to take very long. It might take less Moonves to retire, because I think he's, again, another old white guy. Um, but you're going to need somebody to replace the decision makers that says, wait a minute, you know, if you give kids everything that they want on demand, as well as linear, then we really have a business model. 
that's going to happen, and I think the consumer will, will demand it and will pay for it. And that's the missing element. I think people assume you can't have IP delivery unless it's cheap and less expensive than conventional cable, and that's upside down. It should be more expensive because you get more. So again, I, this observation that it's, it, it will change, I actually think you're right, 10 years. I, I don't want to mix the IP live delivery versus just video usage in general. But we did a survey, uh, we do it a couple times a year as teen survey, and it was about 10,000 teens that we recently completed. And almost 85, this is in the US, so it's high school students, and almost 85% said that, not surprising, that um, IP delivery is their preferred way of viewing video. So when, when you start to put it in that context and you assume their behavior is gonna stay the same, um, this kind of puts some context around what the tidal wave is. Ted? So, yeah, let me just add one thing. So I think <clears throat> it's a good point. There's, there's managed IP TV, which Comcast is halfway through their IP conversion, and, and at least half of X1 is all IP. So I wouldn't want to say that Comcast is slow on this. No, I just meant that they require a box. They're, but they it's, an IP, a box of, it's an IP box, oh, I so I think we're combining OTT delivery. So, so is this, that's the problem, right. Right? That, that they're limiting it to their own proprietary from a box. Tech, yeah. From a technology standpoint, I think IP can be used just as well for OTT delivery as for managed television delivery to a set-top box. So I think most television in the U.S. in less than five years, with the exception of satellite, will be delivered by IP. Well, let me, let me bring up a point, though, and I, I had it further down on my list, but Michael mentioned the set-top box. You know, the FCC is talking about eliminating that or at least opening it up to competition. Is that going to make any difference? Or there was a time when uh, TVs were supposed to start coming with a smart card, an authentication device with a chip in it, or some other similar means of plugging it into your display device, if you will, a 60-inch display device, and be able to authenticate and get the content you want. Uh, does the FCC really? You're well, talking well, about that, cable card. Well, or, cable card, yeah. Or CI. What did I, did I call it something different? You just said a smart card. Smart card, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that was my intent. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so in Europe, it's very popular. You can buy a, a pay TV or a, a, connect, a television set in Europe and plug in the module for whoever your pay TV operator is. It didn't take off here for a variety of reasons, uh, but, but there are places where that's become very common and popular. So are we behind? Larry does a lot of stuff in, in China and in India, and you're familiar our, with what's going on in Europe. Uh, well, net neutrality and, and other things around the FCC, our government gets in the way of this a little bit more than some of the other governments around the world. Okay. Um, slim bundles, you know, had a lot of talk, not a lot of smoke as far as I can tell just yet with uh, Sling and PlayStation View, uh, CBS All Access is coming to the forefront. In fact, they're going to have the next Star Trek coming out on uh, CBS All Access. Uh, through the slim bundles and things what Sling and PlayStation View are doing, are they going to have an impact on this conversion to IP? I didn't. So yeah, I simple can't, answer I, is uh, I yes. never stump anybody. Go ahead. The the, uh, the they've, they've been out. Uh, it hasn't had a material impact yet, and part of it is that the bundles don't have enough content behind them or enough options to really intrigue the average consumer. If you're dedicated on cutting the cable, then uh, uh, Sling is probably the best example of building an offering that is uh, more appealing but there's still some big players who haven't weighed in. The obvious one is what Apple's tried to do and has failed at trying to put together this compelling bundle. The way Apple explains it is that people would rather pay $70 a month for 10 channels they actually watch versus $150 a month for 300 channels. And so I think that uh, there is enough uh, dollars behind the concept of improving the slim bundle and you know, the one that everyone always talks about is ESPN. And we've seen some movement from some bigger content over the past year, but we're still probably a couple years away from getting to the point where an average consumer gets more excited about the Slim Bundle. I think Verizon came out last week and said, 
between, I think, 40% of their subscribers are now choosing uh, some form of a skinny bundle mm -hmm. instead of their traditional bundle. So I, I think it's a trend that's emerging. Whether it ends up saving people money or not, I think remains to be seen, but I, I completely agree that most consumers would rather have choice over the channels they get versus a bunch of channels they feel like they don't want. So that brings up the idea of, you know, the non-traditional platforms. Uh, Michael mentioned Twitch before, which has grown fairly significantly, and, and Amazon made an announcement recently about uh, moving that up a couple of notches. I, I can't quote the announcement specifically. Um, Twitter that has the NFL games on Thursday night, uh, all of what Amazon is doing. Otherwise, YouTube, uh, the debates are everywhere. Um, at Yahoo had an NFL game last year. So there's a lot of things that are changing. So does that help support the conversion? Michael? I mean, I think that we, we have to keep in mind that the content owners are going to ultimately control all this. And so if they if they are foolish, and I'll, I'll let me call the NFL foolish, if they're giving away their content, you know, to Twitch or to I'm sorry, Twitter, um, at the same exact instant, then they're going to train people that they don't have to watch ads, they don't have to pay for it. They're getting a, a feed at you know at the same time. Um, if they're foolish and they license content cheaply to Netflix a week after the show se season concludes then they're going to train consumers that you don't have to subscribe to cable because they get the show relatively approximate in time to its launch. If they are smart, like HBO, and they make that window three years, then no, I don't see any skinny bundle. If you have to wait three years to get content other than linear, then I don't see anybody taking over. I think that the current model actually persists forever. So again, it's up to the content guys. And if they, you know, this $70 for 10 channels sounds great, unless one of the 10 channels you like is Speed Vision or the Weather Channel. And unfortunately, that would be none of us. And so what happens to Speed Vision and the Weather Channel? They disappear. You guys remember Blockbuster? You know, they used to have 5,000 movies in the store and they were replaced by Redbox that had 30 movies in the box. You lost choice. Now maybe it goes back, you get 5,000 movies on demand, but it, that took years before we got back to the selection we had at Blockbuster. You start eliminating 300 cable channels and you're essentially gonna piss off 90% of the television consuming public because they're all gonna lose something they like. My wife watches Long Island Medium on the History Channel. Who would think that that was on, that, that there was a History Channel? I didn't even know the channel. Um, we watch a bunch of crap on TV, it's just that I watch different crap from what you guys watch. So if you take away choice, um, and that's what's gonna happen with the bundles, then I think everybody loses, but in particular, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie can't afford to divorce because they're not getting $15 million a movie, they're getting 500,000 because nobody's watching their stuff anymore. We can't have that happen. So the content guys are gonna cling on to the old model until they all turn into dust. I don't see this migrating the way most people see it migrating because I give credit to Hollywood. They're smarter than, than most people think they are and greedier. Well, you use that word greedy. Uh, yeah, in fact, at, at one time back on a panel, you called them old greedy bastards. They are, but in a good way. In a they, good they way. Create, look, the greed is what creates great content. I mean, think about the money that's floating around between Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, HBO, USA, FX. Um, I just saw the CEO of, of FX quoted as saying there are 500 scripted programs right now available to watch, and 10 years ago it was 100. That's amazing. So is that good for everybody or bad? It's great for us. We have choice. We see Mr. Robot, yeah. which wouldn't have gotten greenlit you know, 10 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, we also see Westworld, which is yeah. really not worth it. And I've got some numbers I'll go into a li little further down the list because he's been the most outspoken about the volume of content. There's just not enough hours in the day. Ted, you've got a comment? Yeah, I think the, on the whole skinny bundle thing, and, and it, maybe it's a good segue from, from the studio thing. So first, a lot of these channels that we get, these aren't independent channels. Their they're, speed, for instance, is not an independent channel. Uh, so these channels are actually part of, of a small number of large studios that really are just using these channels as a way to to you know create subgenres of their of their programming, so 
I think the, the, the studios make these decisions based on, on you know, where people are consuming that and the different types of distribution models, whether it's ad or subscription or what have you. Um, but I think it cause and effect, we should remember the reason these skinny bundles are coming out is the pay TV operators were struggling with uh, retrans fees and rising content costs and the, the business model for pay TV in the US is falling apart. And we are, the, the large operators are basically buying each other, combining DirecTV, AT&T, Time Warner, Charter, um, Altice has you know, been sweeping up a few people, um, Cable Vision, Bright House, et cetera. So I think you, you, what they're doing is they're staving off a problem, which is as these different channels become available and they need to carry them, it, you have to be an absolutely massive operator in order to eke out 9, 10, 11% margins in, this, in the pay TV business here. So the skinny bundles are one of the only ways they can offer something to consumers where the the price isn't going through the roof and you know I think the model the model is not sustainable because they're pretty soon there won't be there won't be any more operators to be combining and and the cost retrans is has completely crushed so you're talking the monopoly down the road no I don't think we'll I don't think our I don't I don't think that's a reasonable situation here because there will always be kind of forced competition between cable and satellite etc but I'm just saying that the current, if you just project out literally three, four, five years, the, the retrans, six years ago, retrans revenue was zero. Now I think this year it was four or five billion dollars. So rebroadcasting fees have just crushed the pay TV operators' margins. Larry? Yeah, I, I think if you, you kind of look back at you know, the era of the great channel creation thing, uh, a lot of it was just on because channel capacity was, was something that was a scarcity. So everybody decided that they had to block stuff. So you take Discovery and you cut one channel into 10 channels. And you know that's the way a lot of these channels came about. And because TV for a long time wasn't terribly good, those channels, which I called the fault channels, it's like there's nothing on my favorite channel, so I go thumbing through this and I find stuff on some of these channels. That's going to go away because now you do have, I mean, there's actually more good stuff on television. So when I watch television, I know exactly what I want to watch and when I watch and I can get it when I want to watch. So a lot of those, you know, the, the issue of skinny bundle, if you don't have 300 channels that are economically viable anymore and that begins to shrink, it doesn't everything kind of come down to a, a, a smaller bundle than But do you know what those before. channels are called in the industry? Hostage channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're called hostage channels because you can't you can't get Fox if you don't carry you know a bunch of these smaller channels that they produce. So that it, a lot of operators wouldn't be carrying those channels if they didn't have to. They, they'll carry them, but if if the no, they have to carry them, if have the, to. If the revenue continues to shrink because I have something better to watch than to go to channel two hundred and seventy four, the reason for Fox keeping that channel I think diminishes too. But the, the pay, you're talking about the pay TV revenue. The operators are the ones who are collecting that revenue. They still are being forced to take those other channels whether they want them or not. Okay, but if nobody watches them, the ad revenue dries up, which is part of the, it's not the whole equation, yep. but it's part. So does companies like, and I talk to these guys on a fairly regular basis, yep. and they're beginning to look at that and what they did 10 years ago and say, does this still make sense? Yeah. I think as you go deeper and deeper and you have better and better television, all those default things become less and less viable. So does that kind of uh, speak for why maybe the content should be on the net, should be on, the, on YouTube, should be somewhere else instead of tra taking up channel capacity? I think Darren's got a... Yeah, I think a lot of this niche content is better suited towards IP delivery, towards a YouTube or what have you. I mean, that's what really where YouTube is really a, a ton of little niches. I mean, the, the biggest drivers on YouTube, for example, are kids programming, gaming, music, and life and style. But you'd be surprised that, like, literally 40% like, of the views on YouTube are kids watching Let's Play or Minecraft and, or unboxings. My son alone is churning up millions of views of egg surprise openings. It's 
Plus, that in stuff IP, can't they don't work take on up TV. spectrum. They, they don't take up space in IP. Right. So if you're if you're thinking about carving out spectrum on a cable plant, that's one thing. But for instance, AT and T, Muverse, who who we've spent a lot of time with with our product, um, C SPAN, and a lot of these they call them PEG channels, public education and government. They're available, but they 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 don't actually start streaming until somebody starts watching them. And for the most part, they never get watched, and therefore they never take up any bandwidth mm -hmm. on their network at all. So I think in the IP world, these channels don't create, they create financial oh. hangover, but they don't create a, a, a spectrum hangover. So does that suggest that the network can handle it? I'm thinking of the point several years ago when the first iPhone came out, it was only on AT&T in the very beginning, and the network kind of hiccuped a lot. Now it's caught up, and you know, with the penetration rate for smartphones, just say smartphones alone, uh, you've got a, you don't really have a problem very often unless you've got a, a, a cell you know, site that's blocked or something. So can the network handle it? I mean, we've gone from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes, and soon we're going to be into zettabytes. If more, it, 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 will it be a smooth transition that will enable IP delivery to work without a hiccup? Larry's pointing about uh, channel up, channel down on his remote, and when we do that at home and we watch something on cable, we expect that channel to pop in instantly. Now, it doesn't quite happen. Even if you've got a really robust connection at home, it doesn't quite work that quickly. So will the network rise to that? I mean. Network providers are going from, you know, upwards of 100 uh, megabytes now. So <clears throat> I think if you uh, take a step back and look at at least just the mobile networks, this whole concept of 5G is setting up to be something that is really boring to talk about, but probably is going to be uh, impactful in terms of video usage. And about, as I said, about every 10 years we get this step up, which probably puts 5G somewhere around 2020 is when that rollout starts. The specs are still to be determined. Verizon's put some specs out there, but this is something that some of the VCs that we've talked to have these just grandiose claims that you can potentially download a standard def movie in a matter of 30 seconds. And um, I think that whether that's true or not, what is true is that this is going to be a step up. And that's had a major impact on video, as Marty was talking about, over the past decade. And I think expect another step function up starting in 2020. Is that a good time frame? Yeah. Okay. I think you're exactly right. 2020 okay. is when it's going to start being measurable in single-digit percentages. So is that why one of the reasons why Google's pulled back from fiber? Because maybe we not only are we moving to an IP network, maybe we're moving to a more consistent delivery wirelessly. Yeah, fixed wireless, for Fic sure. Okay. Well, at least that's what they've said. They, right. meaning Google. Google, yeah. So that is why they've stepped back from yep. fiber. I mean, that seems to be a lot of pundits saying that, including probably all six of you and, and me and half, the, half this room. Um, all right, let's talk about the next wave. I mentioned the next wave is uh, part of the topic title, uh, and I added that to the topic title this time as opposed to prior times because since the last digital Hollywood, Alvin Toffler passed away. And it was Toffler's third wave book to form the basis for the more recent Steve Case book of the same title. And on the cheap shameless plug side of that, a number of years ago, uh, we were honored to work with Mr. Toffler on a future focused business plan that actually got funded or funding commitment from one of the, one of the world's richest people. For various reasons, uh, Mr. Toffler decided uh, not to go forward with as a personal reason on his part that I won't go into. Uh, but in, you know, Toffler's 1968 book, Future Shock, this is preceding uh, the third wave, he talked about the age of personalization. And everybody said, wow, what is that going to mean? I think that term means more today when it comes to future TV than it did in the past. Anybody want to comment about where personalization is today and where it's going to be in the next couple of years? And what it means. What does it mean to the consumer? What does it mean in the smart home? Yeah, for, from our standpoint, when we're putting together these pay TV services for, for our customers, 
personalization is one of the main things that they're looking for. And the, I think that, at least in the pay TV operator space, the definition of personalization is, I don't want to see, I don't want to see the same TV experience that everybody else sees. I want to see something that, that learns and adapts and doesn't show me stuff I don't like and shows me stuff I do. And you can think about how your phone, we might both have iPhones, but if you look at my iPhone, it's going to look very different than your iPhone because we both have kind of set it up to where we're comfortable. And I think that's what they're looking for in television is you can, you can not just have favorite channels and things like that, but you can have an experience that understands that maybe on Friday nights you like watching movies and it'll suggest some movies based on you know, other things that you've watched before. And, and it learns, and so it has some, maybe some Rotten Tomatoes kind of essence to it, and it has um, user experience personalization, and, and it tries to reduce the effort that you have to put into finding something to watch. So that's, I think, what, what we mean by personalized. Well, well Larry likes pushing the, uh, the channel up, channel down button. <laughs> no more, though. Uh, Nobody likes doing that. But, you know, I think from a, the, the content creator point of view, um, you know, this may be subtle, but it's true. We used to, I used to think in terms of what, what can I do that fits into, you know, a network, what can I do for ESPN, what can I do for Comedy Channel and stuff. But as, you know, the, the choice of good stuff continues to, to grow and get better, the importance of individual brands of shows has become much more important to me when I think of creating something. It's it has to stand on its own. It has to know that people have the choice of finding me. And basically, they build their own channel. I mean, each person is, is now totally in control of their viewing experience, or close to totally in control. And then they basically build that, you know, to their likes and stuff like that. So the importance of channels as a brand, I think, diminishes. But shows as a brand increases, at least in the way we think of creation. Michael? You know, I, I think that we should be talking about the consumption of media as opposed to just television. And I think we should use the analogy uh, the consumption of food. So, you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago, you know, maybe you could go down to the tavern for a meal, but otherwise you, you made it yourself or you caught it yourself and cooked it yourself. Um, then suddenly restaurants, then fast food, drive through, now Grubhub, you know, and even Blue Apron, if you want to cook it yourself, it all comes done for you. Um, I have children who I literally was out of town last week. I called, they were having dinner, and my daughters and my wife were each eating something different. Mm -hmm. that just, it blows me away. That Personalization. And my kids are eating sushi at, you know, for dinner, and it's, I don't think I had sushi until I was 30. So it, it kills me. But So then if you think about media, you know, we grew up, those of us who, are, who have six handles in, in, our, in front of our age, uh, <laughs> with three, three network choices mm -hmm. and some local channels, um, my kids are growing up with Snapchat. And, you know, I watch my kids who have phones and have since they were nine, and they are instantly communicating. They believe all news is available instantly, and it is. Um, they, they believe you can order anything you want on the Internet, and you can, including media. So I actually think the world has to evolve to address demands of that generation, and, I, and it is, um, we're not there yet. But, you know, I, uh, truthfully, nirvana for everybody is get whatever entertainment you want, whenever you want it, wherever you want it, on whatever device you choose. That is technologically feasible today, and will happen, I, I'm back with the first thing Gene said, 10 years from now, because you're gonna have the content owners resisting the change, but if people are willing to pay more for it, and be real, you pay more for fast food than you do to make it at home, but it's convenient. You will pay more for all this choice if it's utterly convenient. People will pay more. And if people pay more, Brad can divorce Angelina, everything's gonna be fine. It, I, I agree with you. I think you might actually pay less um, on an individual kind of device less, basis, right, right. but if you combine that together, the total revenue may be higher. And I mean, the, if you look back, we don't need to go back 100 years, but if you look back 25, 30 years ago, there, there weren't cell phones, right? Cell phones were attached to buildings. 
now everybody in this room has their own phone number and probably a bunch of your buildings don't have phones anymore. So the number of phones um, increased dramatically and while you may be able to get a really cheap plan now, the, the total aggregate revenue is dramatically higher because the sockets, the endpoints went through the roof and so I think entertainment can become personal and I agree with you, it's not just TV, it's media all up. It can become personal at an individual level and you may pay kind of micro payments for that personalization which makes you feel like you're spending less money but if you add up all the little bits that we're all spending I think there's still money to be made. Okay. Well, John, go ahead. I have a question. Will content creators make any of that money or is it just the distributors? Oh. Yeah, because the economic, know, the economic <laughs> rent is going to be captured where the value is created so I would say the content owners always win which is, I have a sell on Netflix because they're a distributor, sorry. If they get really good at original content, they'll be a content owner and they'll capture well, what rent. What about the individual producer that goes and shoots if something? If you sell your content into a, to a distrib distribution network, you're going to make the lion's share of the economic rent. Yeah. And the good they news, have to pay for it. The good news for the operators is they do make a pretty good amount of money on right. broadband today, right. so, unlike television. Yeah. And um, gentlemen, uh, second from the end, John Corser, who came in a little bit late, but uh, just since you didn't have a chance to say who you were and what you're doing, he's a production executive at NBC Cable Product, NBC Universal Cable Productions. Has been involved in a lot of content creation uh, of all kinds throughout the years. Hence, the, years without me trying to recite your whole bio for you, John. <laughs> but I think Michael's point is well taken in terms of maybe the term, the heading for the panel future of TV really ought to be media instead of the word TV. But I think we all know what that means. They're, they're synonymous until someone has to really define it. And then it still comes up with a similar definition. Question, Go ahead, John. Is this a finite number of dollars and you have 500 scripted shows and you start to divide that up, pretty soon the, the individual producer makes very little, but the person that collects those together makes a lot. Yeah, you'll have to have a weeding out of content. That's the 500 scripted series are probably more than the system can su sustain in the long run. A um, hundred's too few, but what's going to happen, it's just like movies. I mean, we used to have 220 theatrical release films a year, and it's down to like 130 now. Um, and production budgets are up, but there are fewer bets, and we get more sequels. And so we are shortchanged as consumers because we have fewer selections. You wouldn't get Sophie's Choice made in, you know, now because it's too small. They can't make 100 million bucks on it. But, you know, and I, I actually think that's a real problem with media is we're dumbing it down in the long run. We mm -hmm. will dumb it down if people pay less. But, yeah, I think the guys who make good content are going to do fine. I hope. Me too. <laughs> so, you know, under the heading of no one rides for free, and you might know the uh, couple of phrases that precedes that uh, from an old bumper sticker. But uh, Unless you share a Netflix password, then you're ready for free. Uh, well, <laughs> well, you know, that, that is an issue as well at times. But nevertheless, um, Someone has to pay for it somewhere along the line. Otherwise, I mean, you and I can't go into Ralph's and take what we want off the shelf and say, you know, I'll give you an IOU, we'll pay, pay it later. So on that topic, someone has to pay for it somewhere. Ted had mentioned, you know, everybody has a smartphone. And with the degree that, to which sensors are in the phone, sensors are in our TVs, you walk into the living room, each of, um, Michael's uh, twin daughters and, and wife go in, and Michael each go in the living room, the sensor knows who's there. Ah, Michael, I think it's time for you to watch House of Cards. Uh, you have, we got a new episode, but on that, uh, if you're watching a more traditional uh, broadcast, something that might have been recorded or on demand that was originally on, let's say, one of the networks, you've got targeted advertising at that point. We know from your cookies that you were looking at a new car, a new phone, a new whatever. Um, is that going to increase, help pay for some of this content? If we had better targeted ads, a dynamic ad insertion? I mean, you mentioned movies. Thursday night is the big night for movie ads on traditional TV because movies open on Friday. But if you record that Thursday night show and don't watch it until three Thursdays from now, that movie may have come and gone. So, so Marty, what's wrong Marty, with Warner Brothers still keeping that slot? Marty, Disney does, can't name uh, 
1% of the people who saw Star Wars. They have no idea. The movie ticket sale is anonymous. It's not shared with them. That's freaking stupid. Even if you buy it on your phone, they can't figure it out. I would opt into that. I mean, I would opt in if I see a Marvel movie that they would then notify me and I'd know when the next one's coming. They don't do that. Why don't they do that? I understand privacy, but they have no idea. Maybe Nielsen households, people know who's watching TV, but otherwise, you're 18 to 49. They have no idea who's watching TV. So IP delivery theoretically makes that better. Netflix theoretically knows what I'm watching. They don't share it. So I mean, this is a great dream that all this data is going to lead to better marketing and more targeted marketing. It isn't happening, and I frankly think back to net neutrality, government regulation, President Trump. There's no way that uh, that they're. It's not going to be legal here, which is a shame, because I, I think the the more that they know about me, the better. And you're right. Google knows I did a Porsche search, so I get Porsche ads all the time. You know, I'm, Google Google knows I bought a boat, so I get advertisements for boat accessories all the time. It's crazy, but. Disney doesn't know I saw Star Wars. There's just something wrong with that. So is that a weakness at, at the various studios and other places? I mean, Larry, do you know who watches your show in China? Because you're, you're, you're doing nothing but. Yeah, we, we do a lot of IP-based stuff. And we, we do stuff there. And I think that this, one of the reasons I'm in China is, is because of the millennials, the way they consume media different. And they're kind of ahead of us there. So by being there, I'm, I'm getting to learn things that I could then bring back this way because it has changed. Media consumption has changed dramatically. That will only continue to go. But you know, the other thing that China provides for us is a chance to experiment with the business models. I mean, when you look at this 500 channel world out there, and you know, the, let's say the per channel, the per show take by an indie producer uh, continues to shrink. You got to look not just you got to look for more business models. So in, in China, we're, you know, I mean, Marty knows and we laugh about it. We're in the shoe business in China. One of our shows, you know, the, the girls wear great shoes. and we It's a sex a, in the city type of show. We employ a shoe designer and we have a shoe factory. And everybody laughs that we make more money from shoes than we do on TV. But so what? I mean, we're still, you know, creating this, this TV experience and stuff there. But we're, um, we do a lot of IP-based stuff. And it's now to the point where we do get to share a lot of the data so we know who's consuming um, to, a, to a degree, not, not perfect yet. I think the, the operators, whether it's the mobile operators or the MVPDs or what have you, they, <clears throat> they know a lot about you um, and a lot about your media consumption. Um, Google, their um, DoubleClick guys did a presentation at NAB and Google, I think, is in a unique position to push the limits here. And you might not like this, or you might think it's really cool. But what they're doing is <clears throat> on their Google Fiber television system, which is, I think, in 60 or 70,000 homes, they're doing DVR ad replacement. So once you've moved outside the C7 window, I think, they're, they're getting in there. And they're finding these ads, like you just said, that that are stale and they're replacing them with fresher ads from the same publisher. So they're not writing over a Ford ad with a GM ad or a Disney ad with a Warner Brothers ad. They're, they're freshening those ads on DVR recordings in place so that when you go to watch them later, the ads are fresher. With, with which operator or operators? Just themselves. So Just themselves? On Google So when Fiber I have Time TV Warner Cable, system, I'm, not, no, no, I'm no. still seeing that old stale ad. Now, now DoubleClick is now out pitching the operators. They're saying, hey, look, we did this with our pay TV service, which is only available on small operators, but we're going to, we would like to take this to larger. DoubleClick um, actually has access to a lot more information about all of us. So they have access into credit reporting bureaus. So they may know that you just paid off your car, and because you just paid it off, you might be more in tune to buying a new car. And not only do they know that, but they know it was a pickup truck. And so they're going to target you with an ad for a new pickup truck because they specifically know you just paid off a pickup truck. And they can do all of that today through their system. And on their own pay TV service, they already are. So I think as we look, as, you know, as the business model is facing a lot of pressure, 
it's, it's the same way on the internet already. I don't know about you, but if you shop on Amazon and then suddenly you go to another site and you're like, oh look, there's an ad for something I was just shopping for on Amazon. Like, how did that happen? Well, guess what? Double click is probably one of the main ways that happened. And so some people are creeped out by that. Others feel like, hey, here's, a, here's some additional well, value, because if I'm going to see an ad, I might as well see a relevant ad than an irrelevant yeah. ad. Well, everyone in this room, everyone at this table, everyone in this room knows that happens. They know why it happens, how it happens, but it still gets to be a little creepy at times. Yeah. You're looking at a different site, and all of a sudden that ad pops up for that. Um, capturing viewer, viewers, Michael, for example, mentioned that his kids, uh, Snapchat you mentioned, you know, but Maker Studios, where Darren was for many years, uh, YouTube, Snapchat, Awesomeness, you know, they're all gaining millennials and younger viewers. That's really where it's come from. Uh, last week, there was an announcement that during Premier Week, which is still a beginning, an official beginning of the season concept, um, overall prime time usage was off by around 7% of the 18 to 34 year age, 18 to 34 age group uh, compared with a year earlier. And that's probably going to continue in that direction as there, there are fewer boomers, fewer millennials, and uh, Gen X gets up there a little bit. Uh, any reversal of that trend whatsoever, even when, let's say, some of these people get older and have higher incomes, that those habits ingrain? Gene? Yeah, I, I can't imagine a situation where it reverses. I think that, like we talked about, this is a, a very big, slow-moving trend and irreversible trend. Larry? Yeah, I, I think it's irreversible. I, I, again, I think the way people consume media is just changing, and so it starts with young, and I see it just kind of growing out. And I don't ever see it going back. Maybe one catalyst there's been a lot of talk that snapchat is going to go public sometime in the back half of next year and you know, they're going to have uh, some use of proceeds and, and how they're going to invest that and video has been a key part of their story so i think you know whether they end up becoming a public company or get acquired by facebook is hard to say but i think that's a great example of a product that is on fire right now with millennials not millennials with uh, teens and i think that that's a, another example of why this is just irreversible. So from a content creation green light point of view, John and uh, Darren and Larry have all been involved, are involved in and have been involved in uh, green light decisions, product development, what, what to make. How much of the target markets are you, are you looking at when you are making decisions or your companies are making decisions about what to make next? what to invest in, what product? Sure, I mean, for us, I mean, again, being you know, mainly in China, uh, the buying power is much younger. So we, we look at, you know, particularly people who, who have, let's call it the, the new media consumption patterns and, and stuff and the things that become meaningful for them. Uh, and it's actually interesting because some of the things that have meaning to me, which you think blend over net don't necessarily do. We're doing a show in China that involves the Bruce Lee brand. Um, and one of the things we found along the way, while we think everybody knows who Bruce Lee is, that younger folks in China don't really know who he is. So we got to associate them with people like Kobe Bryant and things like that, that the millennials do know that, you know, so when they say he's cool, he becomes cool by, by default there. So it's it's different, but we, we consider it absolutely from the beginning across all platforms, not just a broadcast platform. John? Well, it seems to me with the Snapchats is the, the, the length of your your drama. Lean into the microphone a little bit. The, the length of your drama is going to change because, you know, we're doing hour-long scripted shows versus, you know, three-minute, if at most, uh, uh, Snapchat uh, uh, you know, shots. It's mostly a marketing thing that at this point for us. It's not, it's not a, we're not designing shows for that at the moment. I mean, the, not where I am. So, Darren? Does, does, the, does the length change? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the format's changed by medium. So, if you're, uh, Vine's a little stale now, but if you were making for Vine, you were shooting a six second piece. And the creators for Vine were very adept at making something meaningful in six seconds, telling something of a story arc, something of. 
um, right? But, See, but, second story arc. <laughs> but it was, but they were good at it, and there were people that really focused on it, and you couldn't just go from YouTube to making vines. It just didn't happen. They were specialists. They were good at it. YouTube is a format as well. So if you're doing Let's Play or something else that's very popular on YouTube now, it's, it's not something you just... Oh, we'll do those. I mean, we'll jump in and make those content as a, as a say, NBC or someone. It doesn't happen. Maker Studios, we've made a lot of content um, trying to reach that audience that we think we're so tuned into. But really what Maker Studios is is a confederation of 50,000 independent creators. Right. And there's a handful of those who have tapped something or found something. So for Maker even to try and distill that and put it in a bottle and say, we figured out what they want to watch, it, it's, it's really, really hard. So it's trying to figure out what a six-year-old watches is really, it's, it's nearly impossible to look through the windshield to see what's going to happen. We really look at the side mirrors, the rearview mirrors, and try and quickly jump upon that. Yeah, Michael? I, I think there's room for you know, many, many apps, many, many websites, and consumers are, are fine going to Amazon to shop and, you know, and going to Google to search. But the lines blur, and so if you're an Amazon Prime member, you'll search for a product on Amazon first if you think you're going to buy it there. Um, I think my kids are, go to Snapchat 70 or 80 or 100 times a day, and if compelling content that might be two hours long shows up there, and they can launch it there, they'll watch it there. So Twitter's experiment with the NFL is that. I mean, I don't go to Twitter to watch videos, except I watched the Alec Baldwin, Kate McKinnick uh, debate last Saturday night on Saturday Night Live on Twitter, because I missed it Saturday, and I didn't think about how to find it on NBC.com, and somebody posted on Twitter, and it was six minutes long. I've never watched a six minute video on Twitter, but I did. So I was there, I saw it, it prompted it, I watched it. I wouldn't watch a football game on Twitter, my kids will. I wouldn't watch a feature length film on Snapchat, my kids will. So if you, can, if you find the audience, I don't think it really matters what the medium is. If you find the audience and you can monetize that audience, more power to you. And that's what I really meant by TV anywhere, that you get what you want, when you want it, probably within the app you want it. Um, and you know, you hear people talking about Facebook becoming a media company. I mean, they, they would like to. Um, they would like you never to leave. <coughs> Amazon, we watch movies on Amazon. We do, I mean, we, and we watch movies on iTunes. Where did that come from? But the difference, I think, you know, is watching it on Twitter, you know, saying, I'm going to watch uh, the NFL game right here on my phone. I don't think that's really the intent when you look at the sharp increase in the number of homes with a Chromecast, with a Roku. Sure. Okay, so it's still watching it on Twitter, but casting it up to your 40, 50, or 60 inch TV. What do your kids well, do? Remember, How old are your kids, if I may ask? Steve, Steve Jobs died five years ago, and yeah. I vividly remember him on stage going like that. And whatever was on his phone showed up on the screen. So, you know, that technology's been around forever. My kids are 16. And, and unfortunately, uh, if they're driving, just try to be on the second story wherever they are. Uh, but they're both driving now. Ooh, well, yeah, that's scary. Darren? I think that's part of it. I mean, I mean for me, I mean, the bigger screen is not always the better screen. The screen you control is the screen that's the best for you. So if you're in your house and you're 15 years old, you're my 15-year-old, I'm probably watching the TV sets, so you're gonna go watch the next screen that you dominate. And size is relative, so if I've got the phone in front of my face, it's, it's a pretty immersive experience, and that's really what you're really looking for, is a fairly immersive experience. Now, Twitter's broadcast of the NFL could be really cool if it was able to be really Twitter, where me and 12 of my friends, if I was into fantasy football, could talk about it and converse and do kind of what, something like Formspring did five years ago, where you had little groups you could talk amongst yourself. Um, put Snapchat same kind of way, but what it did was a bunch of stale, like canned comments that were coming through that were, they were heavily edited, heavily kind of controlled by Twitter. I don't know who wants to watch that. I don't know who wants to watch NFL on, on Yahoo. Those are more. That's them putting down money the same way that Vessel or Verizon or Sling TV puts big checks at the beginning to try and get audience by overpaying for stuff that they don't even know if it's going to resonate with their audience. Well, I'll throw a little X factor out on the form factor and the concept of what is our proper screen to watch what. And there seems to be a limitation to the size of the phone today. It's basically your pocket. But the, uh, if you look at where some of the technology is evolving, especially around bendable screens, which sounds just hard to wrap your head around, but the concept is, is that you can have bendable glass 
by putting a charge through it, it makes it strong again. And there's some company, a company, a German company, Scout, that's working with LG to have a TV where you can kind of bend the edges. The reason why I mention it is that MIT is out there saying that this is eventually going to evolve to a bendable phone. And so imagine a phone that it can be the size of your current phone, but you can fold it and there's no seam in it. And by uh, kind of putting a charge through it, it can basically double in size. And that would, I think that the larger format phones have had an impact on mobile video usage or using your phone to watch video. And you could argue that if in fact we do it, get to foldable phones five plus years, then that could be another step function up in terms of the device that people watch. And that line between your mobile and the big screen just continues to get blurred. So moving on to the cost of content, we've, um, someone's got to pay for it somewhere. Uh, Netflix last week struck a $40 million deal with Chris Rock. And when I read that, it reminded me of when Jim Carrey, uh, many years ago, was the first star to earn $20 million for a movie. That, start, that with Jim Carrey started a big increase in fees paid to other talent. And it, it ended up becoming a bubble. Rock's, dual, Rock's deal is fueling comments once again that Netflix drives up prices for talent in front of and behind the camera, you know, because they're putting lots of money into their content and they're hiring people, again, in front and behind. Is that going to cause other people to go by the wayside? Is that going to change the business model for all content? Isn't Reed Hastings the one who said his... Pardon me? His goal, Reed Hastings, yeah. said his goal was to become HBO before HBO became Netflix. So I think, and that was several years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and there, are, I think even this morning they just released some financial guidance that that their increased spending in content was going to cause them to continue to to have some challenges uh, from a margin standpoint. So they're investing heavily. Amazon also, I I think it's. It's not specifically known how much they paid for the Top Gear guys, but I think what's been guessed is that it's setting, it's, it's once again setting these records for, for um, high quality content. But, but they're worth it. Uh, Pardon they me? Are, they are worth it. Well, we'll see. Uh, worth, <laughs> you, uh, you probably saw my tweet on that Chris Rock thing. I, th I, think, yes. that's, I think that's the end of Western civilization, that $40 million deal. Um, <clears throat> look, I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm far from an expert on content costs, but my understanding is that an hour of scripted drama with a no-name cast costs about two million bucks to produce with a pretty good name cast, about four million bucks uh, an episode, an hour to produce. Um, Game of Thrones, my understanding is 15 million an episode, but they film on location in either Norway or Finland and Ireland, so they, you know, they're, they're moving people all over the place. Um, Baz Luhrmann's piece of crap called The Get Down is apparently 10 million an episode. Nobody's watching it, and raise your hand if you've heard of The Get Down, and then keep your wow. hand up if you keep your hand up if you watched an episode. Exactly, <laughs> um, it is. I, I'm sorry, it is okay, horrible. Two guys. But it's horrible. <laughs> but but regardless, that's that's kind of the going rate. So somewhere between two and 15 million for super high production value. I don't know how long these Chris Rock specials are, but if they're more than 90 minutes, there's something wrong because you can't watch Chris Rock for more than 90 minutes. And the, so it, it's literally $20 million an episode. That's just crazy numbers. That's crazy. I thought Instagram at a billion was too much wrong. Snapchat's supposed to be worth 25 billion. I mean, it's, it's got a bigger audience than Snapchat did, or than Instagram did. But uh, it, this is not sustainable. You can't keep paying more and more and more and more if you're Netflix. I mean, how many people in Germany actually get Chris Rock? And just an editorial comment, the Germans thought Seinfeld was stupid. They didn't think it was funny. So how many, how many Germans, how many you know, Thai, how many Serbians are going to find Chris Rock special funny? This is crazy spending. It's out of control. And so the winner is the guy with the most money, and that is not Netflix. The guy with the most money probably is Amazon. And they win. And, they, and Dr. Evil will spend whatever he has to spend, and, and well, he hasn't. 
Well, they're, they're, Netflix is talking about 50% of their content is going to be original in, yeah. by next year or yeah, the year they, after. They backed off that number on the call by saying 50% of the hours viewed, um, not the hours available, because they're only going to have 1,000 uh, hours of content. They've stopped disclosing the content available on Netflix, but, but our estimate, you probably have a better number, is 15,000 hours of content is available on Netflix. It might be you know 12 and it might be 20. But there's no way they're going to produce 6,000 hours of content in the next year. They're talking about what people watch. And let's be real. If you have seen the blacklist already, you're not watching it on Netflix. So what, what do we watch? Of course we watch originals because they haven't been anywhere else. So that's the only place to watch them. So it totally makes sense. Probably 50% of HBO viewing is HBO originals. Makes sense. I think they'll get there. The question is, are they going to give us 1,000 hours of something we actually want to watch? And the, the answer to that is two hours of that will be Chris Rock for about 20% of the people. And then what? You know, you need something after that. And well, they, if, have, they have Marvel. I mean, the, the, yeah, Luke they, Cage they, and they Jessica do. Jones. And well, I, and they spent who, 200 who, million on 60 episodes. Who has Marvel? No, Disney. Well, yeah, Disney, Disney has, has Marvel. Yeah, yeah. So who's making yeah. the money there? Right, they're paying up for it. And well, that's why it ends up becoming the love-hate relationship that Hollywood has, Hollywood speaking generically, because Netflix is both a customer and a competitor. They're they're a distributor, and they're and they're owned. Their owned originals are crap. Um, Stranger Things is owned. That uh, and Chelsea. That's right. That's right. Name another one, because Narcos isn't one, and none of the Marvel stuff is owned. Right. And House of Cards and Blo and Bloodline and Orange is the New Black are not. Um, I I spoke at a UCLA class, and I 150 MBA students and. Collectively, it took them 15 minutes to name 10 Netflix series, and they got the Marvel ones. There are 71 of them, but you guys haven't heard of 60 of them. And that you have only heard of Stranger Things that they own, maybe Chelsea, and you haven't watched Chelsea. And you better not watch Chelsea. Well, she got her start for you, huh? Yeah. Yeah, You're responsible for her. <laughs> I forgot. You're responsible for her. Okay. What about below the line talent? We're talking about above the line. Which there's, there's, below the line, John? I mean, not owned by Netflix, but the, the, the shows, Netflix is shooting everywhere and they're taking up crews everywhere and they pay the top tier. So if you're uh, doing an independent show and a, a Netflix show comes in, you're losing your crew to those people <laughs> because it's higher pay for them and they don't want to take, take your gig. So uh, it, it's a problem. And you're talking mainly local crew. If you're shooting in New York, if you're shooting in Louisiana, well, if you're matter. shooting... They, they hire from all over. Too. They'll, they'll out outbid you for a line producer, outbid you for a, a DP. I mean, it's not they particularly, it's the production team that has a higher budget than you do on your show. Right. Larry? I mean, again, it's, it's one of the reasons we're, we're in China now, and uh, we, we don't we have to move to that, China. We don't believe that trend <laughs> can continue to, uh, to continue just spend and spend and spend, and, uh, and we, we use China kind of like a Broadway producer would use Connecticut. You don't start your play on Broadway where it's the most expensive. You can debug it. There's a lot to learn, and we don't know the answers, but we will tell you that millennials are totally different than, uh, you know, than, than older viewers, particularly here in the U.S. and stuff. So it gives us a chance to debug formats, create them, own them as an independent, which becomes hard if you try and start it here, and then bring them back the other way where we could actually after we have them refined, we can bring the economics down. And by bringing in other parts of the business model, which are not done here, like owning shoes, uh, we can actually begin to offer programs that are already tried and true at less money than somebody else. So, you know, speaking of China and your strong experience there, uh, Chinese companies, and that was the first thing you said to me this morning, but Wanda's in town buying stuff. Now, most of what we've seen Let's just say generically Chinese companies buying has been feature film related, but other than Wanda coming in and buying Dick Clark, is are they gonna buy more T V? Are they gonna continue with features? What what what's gonna happen with Chinese companies generically? I don't care about mentioning any one specific name. Well I I think they're they're looking at T V heavily now. Yeah. I mean there's there's a lot of I, I I don't know if they're at the point where they understand the business enough to really pull the trigger on some of those deals. So I think they're a ways off. But they have begun to look at that. Uh, I just had a group in that we work with in China that you know we basically did a VR tour. Um, 
you know, and they're, they're looking at, you know, not just single person VR, but location based VR and stuff like that. So it, clearly the appetite for investment is spreading well beyond feature films. Gene, from your point of view of Chinese companies? Yeah, they're still struggling with the piracy issue, uh, more broadly in content. Uh, that's slowly getting better. And if you look at companies, uh, Baidu has a, a video platform that's uh, gaining traction, has been for the past several years, and I just think it kind of all wrap, rolls up into the same bigger topic, which is there are large dollars that are financing this and gonna kind of enable us to, to be something big in China over the next decade. Last item before we go to Q&A, News, news is something that's been a staple of TV for a long time. Uh, and yet now Pew reported that four in 10 Americans get their news online. Many get it on social sites with 64% of, of their study getting it on one site and 26% using two sites. Uh, news is vitally important and it's gonna change probably again after the election because people are tuned into it. Uh, is that also indicative of a continuing trend? getting news, you got a big smile on your face well, for some reason. Re real news is probably 90% online. Um, niche news, so sports, you, we do watch Sports Center, and it's not because we want to know the scores, it's because we actually like the commentary. And, yeah. and some of us do watch Fox News because we think that's the real news, and some of us watch NBC, because MSNBC, because we think that's the real news. Mm -hmm. So these niche channels are what really uh, allows that vestige of linear news delivery to, to exist. But in terms of like, you know, if you hear that, you know, s some terrorist group attacked, you're going online. You're not, you're not turning on television to find out what's going on. You go online immediately. And I'd say that's, yeah, you go, again. You go to the uh, television for commentary, not for right, news. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I actually think as long as there's niche programming, and sports is the biggest niche, but there's niche programming, then, then linear, programming will be fine for news for a long time. Larry? Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much agree. I think I, I go to television for commentary and I get uh, probably 100% of my news online now. Yeah, I think the TV, the TV news has turned into, they, in order to compete for viewers, it's turned into almost part entertainment, whether it's the, the talent they hire or the way they, the way they present the news that's part of why you're tuning in, is for that experience, not just to get the news. Big numbers tonight for the debate, big ratings? Guesses? Everything's relative. Uh, well, okay. So All right. the first the, debate the was third most popular, but, but more, than, more <laughs> popular than anything else on TV tonight. Well, that's part of the question. What are the hurdles? First one was 85 million people? Uh, 80, 60, yeah, 80, I think. 80 and 65 or something. And 65. Yeah. We'll see. All right, how about uh, some questions uh, from the audience? Art? Yeah, so uh, I, I think Marty and the disruptors, you're always talking about disruptors, not that you're disrupting, but your views on it. And uh, for years we've been talking about over top, and we've been talking about uh, all, all sorts of uh, uh, getting into personalized uh, internet delivery. But with the new television, Uh, what was the question on that? Well, the, the new standards coming out, will broadcast yeah. TV with the new standards be sort of like the revenge of the nerds, going back and taking over a lot of the interactive uh, relationship that uh, other uh, delivery systems have? And NTS3 is what you were thinking of more specifically. Yeah. Anybody got a comment? I'm not knowledgeable enough on that standard. I, I am, but I... I don't think it's going to change anything personally. I, I think behave, consumer behavior and the way things are going with distribution becoming more one to one and less you know one to many. I, I don't think ATS three C three is going to fix that. Catherine.
often is Snapchat repeatable? repeatable? Yeah. Oh yeah, <clears throat> very repeatable. There's that many kids who come in out of nowhere with enough money to bankroll the first Oh yeah. Time. They got Peter Thiel behind them. Yeah. <laughs> There's, sorry, I live in the Bay Area. I know so many, so many smart, rich kids with great business ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that can happen uh, okay, so you know, continually. The is coming from a poor kid of color in Boyle Heights. Who listens to them? Because that's the next Snapchat. That I mean, that's the same kind of question as asking, is there really a, a, a mass savant in the middle of Inglewood that's not getting the right kind of there is. Yeah. Of I mean, there is. There is. There is. I mean, that's the, 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 that is the barrier to our culture that? in I general. Know. I mean, it, we, we don't have access for those people. We need it. I mean, we're a bunch of white guys up here. Uh, it, it, it's up to us to change it. And we do. And we try it every day. But it's, it, the, the barriers to entry are still there. We're going to work on those. I think, per personally, though, I think if if a lot of these startups that you're talking about are kids, smart kids, I, I think the if you look at what Amazon and Microsoft and Google are doing with their cloud tech to make it free in small scale, uh, I think if there's smart kids out there, even kids who don't have a lot of money, if they have smart ideas, they have available they they have access to the same kind of tech at very low cost. So I think the barriers today are a lot less than they were in the past. Um, but there's still barriers. There's still barriers for sure, but it's not, I don't think it's that they can't get in. Let's give a, this gentleman. I don't believe that, but it, it's not a bad place. I mean, Facebook really is a place mostly for older people now. I mean, <laughs> Facebook is not where my daughter goes. Facebook is not where most people under 25 go. I mean, maybe obligatorily they go there, but they're more likely to be on Snapchat or Instagram. You are calling out a business risk that all the satellite guys around the world have, which is one of the only ways they've been able to command higher ARPU and hold on to subscribers with you know, just pure broadcast tech is by paying for exclusive sports content. And, and the, the answer to your question is the highest bidder is going to get the package. Yeah. And so is DirecTV uh, savvy enough to recognize that maybe they go away if they're not the highest bidder? Now that they're part of AT&T, which is a much larger enterprise and probably it matters more to them and they have much deeper pockets, I, I don't think Facebook's foolish enough to bid $2 billion or $5 billion for that, but I didn't think Netflix would pay $40 million for Chris Rock, so you never know. Um, and and, and there will be a breaking point, you know, and it's hard to walk away. Um, Netflix walked away from stars at $300 million. bucks. They said no, which showed a lot of discipline. Um, they would not say no today, you know, they're paying $40 million for Chris Rock. So it really it, it, I don't think Facebook is as interested in being a broadcast network as question suggests. Um, oh, I'm working with Federal Media to form a partner with Facebook to take over it. Uh, where basically their provider, but the league does its own with uh, approval of Facebook, they're going to be much more efficient than advertising. Yeah, I think the leagues the leagues are concerned though about audience, and I think that that they they need audience, not just the audience uh, is on the decline though. Sunday night football, yeah, yeah, Thursday night football have both been down last week I think was seven percent from year over year uh, there's a lot of arguments about why that is and what's causing it whether it's Kaepernick and what's going on there or just oversaturation or some other reason it's the Rams coming back to LA I'm pretty sure it's not I'm pretty sure it's not Kaepernick I'm sure but I mean I but it's it's always nice to talk about moving over to these new platforms but if you took football to any any online native platform, you're going to get into a whole new realm of measurability that they don't even want to think about. Because right now they, they live in the good graces of, of 1950s television where they just get a, a Nielsen rating and they as assume everybody's got their face in front of the TV set. If they had the measurability that they have online, did they watch the video for how long the video, when did they drop off of the video? I mean, yeah. I mean that's, that, that's, that's a nightmare. Let's go with one last question, this gentleman right here, please.
Yeah. So international and sports. Larry, we talked about the NBA in China. I've got a couple of comments you can make. Uh, well, it's you. It's actually bigger in NBA in China. It's probably bigger than it is here. Uh, the basketball. So we're, we're actually doing a, um, and this is a good example, where we created a basketball-related reality show that we're testing there with the specific idea of getting it to work there and then bringing the format back here uh, or to any country where basketball is big. And, and again, it's, you could, you could debug these programs, you know, without the eye of the New York Times and, uh, you know, without the expense of, uh, and the gatekeepers, without the expense okay. of the gatekeepers. And really look at these things, again, not just as programs, but as businesses. And Are you our, producing content in China and you're saying there's no gatekeepers? You want to know something? There's a lot actually, of control over the. There's actually, for what I do, there's a lot less than. I have Rupert Murdoch here. Yeah. Okay, and I use Rupert as the devil. I have a lot more. <laughs> I, I have a lot more freedom as a creative in China. I have five shows on TV there. You show me one person in the U.S. that gets five shows up in six years in the U.S. other than Dick Wolf. Yeah. So anyway, um, before we go, thank you for being here. I've got a one o'clock panel I'm doing on the future of film. I've got a longer title than that. Hope to see you there. Join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion today.